I've got 13 tomato varieties we're gonna check out this year. Six that I grew successfully last year and another seven new ones that I'm trying out for the first time this year. Some of these may be ones you've tried before. Some of them you may hate, some of them you may love. Let's go through each one of these little green monsters and I'll tell you why I picked it, what it should taste like, what I think might be interesting about them, maybe a little history and what you can expect when they're full grown, juicy and delicious. Stay tuned. Hey there, plenty people. Welcome or welcome back. It's Nick from Propist. Looking around here at this beautiful day, you probably wouldn't believe me if I told you we've had an unseasonably cold and wet spring. This is the second week of May and we're finally starting to get some sun here. I live in North Vancouver, BC, Canada, which is on the west coast. We're designated zone 8B. We're kind of right bordering 9A, but for all intents and purposes, 8B. Being in the Pacific Northwest, we're pretty used to having gloomy, cold, wet weather. So it's kind of nice to have sunshine. Now, for some of what I'm going to tell you to make sense, there's going to be a little setup involved. However, if you're an impatient type, you're just itching to get to the plants, you can use the chapter markers up here. I've listed them in the description below. You can jump ahead to any tomato variety that you're interested in. Otherwise, feel free to stick around. We'll go through a little bit of legwork here and then we'll get into the plants shortly. If you stick around till the end, I actually have a bonus tomato adjacent plant for you to check out. So if you can believe it, the nighttime temps around here haven't cracked 10 degrees until just recently. So we're talking second week of May before we start seeing weather warm enough that we can actually keep tomatoes outside in the evening and at night. Right now, we're just starting to see that kind of weather be common. And honestly, I'm looking at the forecast for the next couple of weeks and it looks like it's still going to dip below 10 degrees Celsius next week. So this is the best we can do is to get stuff in the ground now. Anyhow, it's been a wet, cold spring so far, and I'm really hoping that was the last of it until fall. I think if you watched my previous videos, I probably mentioned at least once that I'm a container gardener first and foremost. Most of my pots out here are fabric pots that I grow out in the front yard. And my containers are here because my backyard doesn't get a whole lot of sun. I live in a suburban community where there's very small backyards, not a lot of space. The light is pretty restricted and our backyard is actually bricks. So we do have flower beds around the edges, but they're not the greatest for growing anything because the lack of light is just killing everything out there. So I do tend to do most of my growing here in my container garden, which as you can see is mostly barren for the time being, but it's gonna get populated pretty quickly. So I grow most of my veggies and herbs out here in the container garden. It's easy to move, containers are relatively simple to deal with, everything's pretty well contained, constrained, and I can tweak the soil to my heart's content for each container out here without affecting the others. So lots of benefits to growing in containers, may not be the prettiest thing, but works for me. Now, that all being said, if I had the space, I would likely grow in larger beds if I could. Now, based on the space that I do have, I have to work with what I've got back here. We had a pretty busy start to 2023 and I never got around to starting my own seeds. So what does that really mean? That means that I'm gonna have to buy transplants, plugs, starts, seedlings, whatever you wanna call them. I can either go to a grower, I can go to a greenhouse, I can go to a grocery store. Now, I like to shop at the local nursery. It's about five minutes drive away from me and I managed to find a lot of good stuff this year. Now, what is buying transplants or veggie starts or whatever you wanna call them? What does that really mean? That means that you're kind of stuck with whatever's left. So in my case, I had pretty good selection because I got in there relatively early. Our season started so late here that there was still quite a bit available and they hadn't even put the plants out for sale yet when I went in there. They were just starting to. So I managed to get in ahead of the crowd, if you can think of it that way. So initially, about four weeks ago, I went out looking for veggie starts, tomatoes, peppers, the like. That's the kind of stuff that I like to grow out here for the most part, solanaceous crops. I went out looking, there was nothing. They hadn't even put things out yet. It was still pouring rain, barely clearing five degrees at night, and it was just a horrible time to be trying to buy plants for outside. So now, last two weeks, things have changed. I went outside and it's pushing 32 degrees yesterday. For us, that's unseasonably warm. We're a good 10 degrees Celsius above the norms for that time of year. It's been a bit of a wacky time. So we go from having plants that are looking like they barely might survive outside because of the cold to plants that are already wilting, which is not a great look. Now that the weather's turned, I went back out shopping for plant starts the other day. Managed to find a lot of interesting things. I also did grow a number of tomatoes last year. So this year, I'm gonna catalog the seven tomato varieties that I'm growing. And I do want to spend a little bit of time touching on the six tomato varieties that I grew last year. Give you a little bit of intel about those guys. And hopefully you can pick out some crops that you think will grow great for you. So what does this all boil down to? 
But what it means is that the weather has turned here and I need to get these transplants out. They've been sitting in my outdoor greenhouse, getting a little too humid for my liking, and now they're gonna go outside. So before I do that, I want to go through them with you so I can give you a few suggestions for some varieties you may wanna grow and you can take your pick and see what works for you. So this year, I'm gonna be growing more heirlooms than hybrids. I didn't make this choice consciously. It just kinda of happened because I was looking at specific tomatoes and that's what I found. Now again, that's one of the drawbacks about using starts as opposed to planting your own seeds. You're kind of stuck with what's out there. At the same time, I found a really good selection that I'm pretty happy with. I'm a big fan of not replanting the same crops year after year, unless you really, really like something. And in my case, I haven't planted enough tomatoes over the last three years that I'm actually familiar enough with any variety to be happy and just keep planting it over and over again. So for me, I just want to keep on experimenting. Coming back to the whole hybrid versus heirloom debate, I'm not going to get into all the details of this. I'll do another video on this at some point in the future, but suffice it to say that hybrids are bred on purpose. Heirlooms tend to be handed down from generation to generation. Hybrids are basically crossbred, cross-pollination between two or more varieties that have been chosen for selected traits. Some of those features that you'll get out of a hybrid are hardiness to a certain climate, increased resistance to certain diseases or viruses or pests. And in many cases, you're gonna find that they may have improved cracking resistance. So, you know, fluctuations in water don't affect the skin of your tomato too much. And then oftentimes it's gonna increase the yield and the productivity of the plant. Now, the two major drawbacks that you're going to run into with hybrids are the question of taste because people tend to say that heirlooms have better taste on the whole. However, the newer strains of hybrids that are coming out are definitely improving on that and that's become more of a focal point. Now, the other factor that you just can't get around is that you can't replant hybrid seeds. Hybrid seeds are not true to type. So if you were to try and replant an F1 hybrid, F1 indicating first filial generation, so that would be the very first crossing of two plants. If you're to try and replant the seed that were the outcome of that, you would not necessarily get the same plant. So that's something you have to be aware of. If you try and save seed with hybrids, you're not going to get anything like what you expected. The other thing to keep in mind is that hybrid seeds do tend to be more expensive. When you're buying the actual plants themselves as starts, maybe less of an issue. I find that the prices are all pretty similar, although some of the hybrids I've found can be up to twice the price of the equivalent heirloom. Now, heirlooms, on the other hand, are considered true to seed. That means that heirlooms typically have been passed down from generation to generation. All heirlooms are open pollinated, means that they have been pollinated by the wind, by insects, or by hand by people, but they have not been purposefully hybridized. When it comes to heirlooms, there's a bit of a debate about what constitutes an heirloom in terms of how old the actual heirloom variety is. Now, people argue anywhere from about 40 years, which puts us back into the 80s, and I kind of disagree with that one, to 50 years to World War II. And now the reason for World War II is because hybrid seeds started to become commercialized immediately after World War II. And I think that's a good barometer of what constitutes an heirloom as far as I'm concerned. So anything that kind of predates World War II can definitely be considered an heirloom. Now every open pollinated tomato is not necessarily an heirloom. So you can kind of consider the heirloom a subset of open pollinated plants. The most important thing that you need to keep in mind with heirlooms is that heirlooms are true to seed, which means if you save the seeds from one of your heirloom fruit, you should get exactly what you put in. So you can keep on using the same seeds year after year. You can buy one set of seeds and just use them ad infinitum if you're able to preserve them. There's one thing of particular annoyance when it comes to buying transplants, and that is the fact that the tags are not always clear as to what you're getting. You look at one of these guys, there is no whole lot of information. Now it tells me that it's a red grape grape tomato variety, but I from this cannot even tell if I'm looking at an heirloom or a hybrid. So that can be a little frustrating. You have to kind of look it up yourself and go with your best guess. From what I can tell in most cases, I think I've categorized everything correctly. It's possible that in the case of something like a red grape, for some reason, there is both a hybrid and an heirloom. Who knows? So if I'm sitting at a nursery trying to decide what to buy, typically I'll either hold off or I will do a quick Google search first, look up the name of the variety, do some research, whether it's an heirloom or hybrid, and you can look for things like whether it's determinate or indeterminate as well. Now, determinate basically means that the plant has a specific size-ish that it's gonna grow up to. Indeterminate means that it's gonna keep on growing and vining, potentially bushing and vining out until it basically hits the end of the season. At that point, your plant is done and it's gonna get killed off by the cold. Why don't we take a look at some of these tomato plants? I've broken these down by pretty common categories. And I think most of the tags and seed packets that you'll find will indicate something like this. It's gonna be one of grape, cherry, slicing, which is sandwich slicer type tomatoes, paste or sauce tomatoes, which are kind of your Romas, your San Marzano's, Amish paste, that sort of thing. And then there's your beef steaks. Beef steaks are the, the big chonky ones. 
Now for each tomato variety, I'm going to show you what it looks like currently, what it looked like when I bought it, because I've got some footage of that. Some of these plants actually have a history that is pretty interesting to me at least. We'll talk a little bit about the growth habit, what it looks like, see if I can dig up some photos for you, about the taste and the texture of the plant and any kind of special features it has, particularly for hybrids. If it's an heirloom, if it has any weird looks or anything like that, we'll get into that too. Just for reference, I purchased most of these plants this year from one local grower. I did not do this on purpose. It just happened to be that the nursery I was at purchasing the majority of my tomato starts happened to carry like one grower and that's tried and true out of Burnaby, BC. They're a local grower, so I have no problem supporting them. Cool thing about these guys specifically is that they're certified organic. That means they don't grow with synthetic fertilizer or pest killer. And they also use recyclable and biodegradable pots and containers. So that's always good to hear. So I'm starting off with these guys. You can see I've got two of these here. And these are black cherry heirloom tomatoes. I do have two of these guys currently in the pot here. These guys are a cherry tomato with a pretty firm texture. They're hardy plants. They should ripen in about 65 days approximately. As a cherry, they will look a little different than your usual cherry. They're black. When they say black, it's actually kind of a dark mahogany color, what you'll see. The first signs of these guys ripening is that they're green at the shoulders and then they turn kind of a darker mahogany eggplant color at the bottom. Apparently the fruit actually has a really rich, complex and deep and smoky flavor. They do really well roasted and in pizzas, salsas, soups, and the like. These are indeterminate, like the vast bulk of cherry tomatoes are, which means they're going to grow pretty tall. You're going to need to stake them, cage them, that sort of thing. At a minimum, these are going to get up to around five feet tall. I have had cherry tomatoes grow as far as like eight, nine, ten feet tall pretty easily without much effort, as long as they have some support. For those of you not familiar with the black cherry, the black cherry is originally from the northern coast of the Black Sea, just off of modern day Crimea. I am not entirely sure of the history of these things, but from what I've been able to tell, they come from soldiers returning to Russia from the Crimean War, popping back and spreading these out back when they got home. The black tomato is actually pretty unique. I think originally there were only a handful of varieties and now there's up to 50 or so that are available. Now being an heirloom, these guys are not going to be as hardy as some of the other cherry varieties that you'll find. I did hear on Millennial Gardener, which is a channel that I would highly recommend if you're just getting into the tomato hobby, that these guys tend to not be as disease resistant as other plants. I think his main complaint was that they were a poor performer when it comes to disease resistance and cracking and splitting. So I'm hoping that I won't have that same problem, but I think with consistent watering, you can kind of avoid some of the splitting issues that you run into that and picking your fruit as early as you possibly can now it's my first time growing them in this climate so i really don't know if this is going to be a thing for me or not or if it's purely just due to the region that he was trying to grow in i'm on the west coast we have a bit drier like less humid summers definitely cooler temperatures than north carolina in that scenario maybe we're going to be having different outcomes we'll see but i do think that these should be really good for me i love black tomatoes i grew a black crim last year which i'll talk to you guys about in a little bit if it's anything like the black crim, which is a completely different type of tomato. If the flavor is anything like that, I'm sure I'm going to be really happy. Cherry tomatoes tend to do super well for me here. So we'll see. I'm looking forward to it. I'm glad I have two plants as a backup here, just in case. I'm looking forward to trying them out. Now, the other cherry tomato that I'm growing this year is this Rapunzel, which is an F1 hybrid. I originally purchased this guy <laughs> from a grocery store. So, you know, the difference between buying from a grower like a nursery or a greenhouse and a grocery store is that you're going to get better intel on the plant that you're buying from the nursery or from the greenhouse. Buying it from the grocery store, you're pretty much on your own. So in this case specifically, I googled it while I was standing there and the signage that I was looking at said 45 days to maturity, which seems crazy fast for any kind of tomato. But I mean, for a cherry tomato, I could kind of see it. However, when I looked it up online, it ends up telling me 68 to 70 days, much lengthier than I was expecting, you know, compared to some other tomatoes that might be maturing at like 55 days. In this case, 68 to 70 days is right there around mid-season. Now, the cool thing about the Rapunzel specifically, and this is why it's named the way it is, is that it grows up to 40 fruit per stem on these long tresses. It looks pretty awesome. The Rapunzel is really productive and can yield a pretty large amount of three quarter inch, one ounce cherry tomatoes. I wasn't really gonna get a second cherry tomato, but when I saw this one, I thought to myself, I gotta see it just for the looks. Now, apparently these guys are really good for cooking or for making juice. It puts out these three quarter inch ish one ounce cherry tomatoes which i think it's a really good size for making pretty much anything it looks like the flavor profile is pretty good too in terms of being very juicy slightly sweet with very little acidity which is always nice because i get a lot of acid reflux so you know 
This one being an F1 hybrid, which is actually pretty new as far as I can tell, a specific variety. Like I only see references in the last five or six years. It does seem to be resistant to fusarium wilt. This is not guaranteed because the signage on here, as you can see, as I mentioned before, not a lot of information on here. This Lettuce Garden brand doesn't really offer a lot of info online either. So I'm basing my info on what I can find for the Rapunzel in general. So I'm hoping it lines up with that. Again, with a cherry tomato, you wanna to stake these guys. These can get easily six and a half, eight feet tall if you want to. It's definitely gonna to grow to at least four or five feet without you doing much of anything. Crawl it up against a wall, it'll grow that high. So I would expect that throwing this into a cage is where it's at. Uh, my previous experience growing cherries the last couple of years, I've had huge gigantic yields inside of these cages that I've made. I probably wouldn't have gotten a second cherry tomato for this year. I thought one cherry, one grape is usually enough, but the difference between the Rapunzel, just the look of it, and the black crim should be enough to give me some variety that I can try both. What I grew last year, this was the Super Sweet 100. Now, I don't have a photo of this handy for my own growing, but I'll show you a photo over here so you can see what it looks like full grown. These guys, if you have grown any kind of cherry tomato in the past, you've probably either come across the Super Sweet 100 or the Sweet 100 yourself. This is a pretty common hybrid. This Super Sweet 100, it's some descendant of the Sweet 100, which is at some point along the lines of the parent hybrid. You're gonna get about one ounce size fruit off of these guys. Very sweet. By the name, you can tell it's super sweet. It's also super productive. The fruit grows on many multi-branched clusters and each cluster can carry up to about 100 tomatoes, which is pretty crazy. So you can actually have one single plant put out something like 500 plus tomatoes, which is nuts. But based on experience last year, I don't doubt it at all because even I was getting hundreds of cherry tomatoes off of that one single plant. And I only had the one plant. I had trained it to a single liter. Once it got to about four feet high, I decided to let it branch out with two additional liters. So that was probably a little overkill. I have a cage that's probably about 20 inches wide. In that space, that was tight. I think I probably should have stuck to two liters and that's what I would do in the future. So that all being said, the Super Sweet 100 is a very, very, very vigorous grower. So you definitely want to stake this thing and cage it if you have the room for it. Give it some space around to breathe too because they really get big. These guys are very disease resistant and at the same time they're also kind of weak to cold. Speaking in like MMO speak here, these guys are not very cold hardy. I mean tomatoes in general aren't cold hardy but these ones specifically are not cold hardy and they really don't do well with any kind of weather changes. If you live in an area that has drastic weather changes throughout the course of the summer or even in the late spring and early fall, Something to keep in mind if you're in a milder climate. All right, so now we're entering grape tomato territory. So this is the Sweethearts F1. It's an F1 hybrid. It's an indeterminate grape tomato. It matures in about 60 days. The nice thing about the grape tomato, and I'm a big fan of the grape tomato, is that compared to a cherry tomato, if you've never grown a grape tomato before, the grape tomato is probably about double the size-ish of a cherry tomato. The cherry tomatoes can be a little fatter, the grapes are going to be a little bit more elongated, so oval shape, kind of like a, a grape, but a really large grape, think of it this way. So they can get up to about three, four centimeters long, it's so like kind of an inch, inch and a half. The really nice thing is if you're into, like me, making pasta sauces, making flatbreads, bruschetta, where you want to slice up small tomatoes, these are perfect because, you know, compared to a cherry tomato where you go for the slice and you take off half your finger, the advantage here is that with the grape tomato, you can kind of hold onto it while cutting it, which makes life a lot easier. Flavor wise, they're really good. I've never grown the Sweet Hearts F1 before, so this should be interesting. I try and grow at least one grape tomato a year. The fruit for these guys is very bright red, hence the name Sweet Hearts. It's also very crack resistant and firm, and from what I understand, has a really good shelf life. So that's something to keep in mind too. This specific variety is resistant to fusarium wilt and tobacco mosaic virus which I have never encountered personally, but I've heard of quite a bit. TMV seems to be pretty common in certain parts of North America. Something to keep an eye on if you're uh, in the right part of the world for it. These guys specifically, the Sweethearts F1, are very prolific and they have pretty huge yields and they do really well in containers and in small spaces. So I think if you're a home grower and you're a patio grower, this is probably one for you. They do mature, like I mentioned, in about 60 days. So as you can see, I already got some flower growth on here, which is not ideal. I need to get this thing repotted pronto. I may just pluck off this entire group of flowers just because it's gonna end up being transplant shocked as we move it from pot to pot. And these probably aren't gonna do very well to begin with. I'll probably give it a good start, take off the bottom few branches and then move this in and kind of root it pretty high up. And especially the grape tomatoes tend to grow pretty quick. So by the time I'm transplanting, they're already reasonably tall. I mean, this is the tallest out of all the plants I've got here. You know, you take off the bottom three, four branches that are on here and you can root 
all the way up the stem on these guys. So it's something to keep in mind when you're potting your transplants up is you can putt all the way up to at least the bottom big leaves that are healthy enough and then you can probably go up to about here if you wanted to. As with all grape tomatoes, you're going to want to stake these guys up. Like they can take up a lot of space, particularly the grape tomatoes that I had last year, just like cherry tomatoes can get pretty big, pretty tall, pretty bushy. You may want to train them up to like one stem, maybe two, put them on a stake and then cage them if you have the kind of environment that is right for it. In my case, I cage all of my indeterminate tomatoes and it gives them a decent amount of room to grow, but it can still hold up the branches as the plant grows taller and taller. I usually grow four or five indeterminate tomatoes and all of them are caged so and you know the cages are a good six seven feet tall at the end of the day so it's a decent amount of space available for them to keep growing and kind of bushing out as they grow taller so this is my 2022 grape tomato this is the red grape <laughs> If you're from Canada like I am, I'm sure you've seen President's Choice around Superstore or Loblaws, whatever you want to call them. They tend to buy and repackage plants from other growers. So there's not a lot of information on here. You get the basics of like what you're trying to grow for and the name Red Grape. But the Red Grape is another F1 hybrid, I believe. In this case, I'm not sure if it's the same Red Grape you see on the internet or not. This is an indeterminate plant that grows between 55 to 70 days maturity. Again, the Red Grape is so vague sounding, it's really hard to tell what I'm dealing with. So I'm assuming that the information I find online for Red Grape is the same as what we're dealing with here. I found the matching kind of 55 to 70 day timing on the ones I was looking at. So I'm assuming it's the same ones. You know what? Red grape is about as vague a name for a tomato as you can get. So based on my experience growing this and of what I found online description wise, these guys can get very, very tall. This I know for a fact. You can get up to 20 fruit per cluster on a pretty tall, long vine. As a mine, personally, I had this up to about eight feet, nine feet last year. It actually outgrew my tomato cage, which is about seven feet off the ground. And then kept growing for another couple of feet above that and you know that's some productivity there because like a really big plant b tons of tomatoes off of it so the other cool thing about it was again just like the previous sweetheart f1 i had great shelf life on the fruit that i got off of it so we harvested up our last harvest right before the first frost date it's usually around halloween and we managed to keep fruit all the way through new year which is amazing so they were green when we harvested them but i still had tomatoes particularly grape tomatoes to eat come new year that were still in good shape and really were just starting to dry out a little bit which is pretty amazing in terms of shelf life and just being able to hang on to that fruit after you harvested it it's killer so again this is a pretty generic grape tomato it's got a pretty bright sweet flavor they do really well in patio containers they grow pretty big you want to give them a little space so that they can bush out fruit size similar to the sweethearts f1 is again kind of in that anywhere from about a half an ounce to two ounce range and between kind of one to two inches in length which is pretty good size fruit for an oval grape tomato again these are crack resistant resistant, thick skinned, and good shelf life. Similar to the previous grape tomato, these guys have some resistance to fusarium wilt and to tomato mosaic virus. So again, these are pretty good choice. They're kind of generic, nothing too sexy here, but if you're looking for a good grower that has pretty reasonably good flavor and nice and sweet and very multi-use and they're hardy and hard to kill and good shelf life on the fruit, this is an excellent pick. So now we're moving into the sauce or plum or paste tomatoes, depending on what you want to call them. That covers things like Roma tomatoes, the Amish paste tomatoes, and it covers things like the San Marzano, which is the one I've got right here. So the San Marzano is an heirloom. This is a paste tomato. These guys get to be about eight ounce. They are kind of oblong oval shaped tomatoes. These guys are great for making tomato sauces and pasta sauces. And basically when you empty them out, the seed cavity is very small. So it's a lot of meat to the tomato and there's not a lot of like seeds and water inside of it. So they're really good for that sort of thing. The San Marzano is an 80 day indeterminate. Again, you're gonna wanna stake these guys up. My experience with the San Marzano is depending on how you grow them. Like I've had plum tomatoes in the past. I've done the Romas and my Roma at the time was a determinate Roma. Now these guys are indeterminate. So they're gonna keep on going. And especially with the weight of the fruit that we're talking about here, where you're getting up to like eight ounce territory 
you're going to want to stake these guys and give them some support. And according to what I've read, staking is required for these, so it's worth keeping that in mind. These guys have a pretty mild flavor. They're great for canning, great for pasta sauces, good for salads too, but I mean, it's nice and thick, not very juicy, more like meaty. So San Marzano, the actual fruit itself, is in the Roma category, and it's uh, kind of thinner and a bit more elongated. So the fruit is slightly different looking than your typical Roma, but it's in that same group. You can see here, I am getting some dried leaf business going on here. I'm actually just gonna pluck this guy off. There we go. I'm gonna bury the stem, I'll let this heal over a little bit because it took a little bit of a chunk out, and then I will bury this probably up to about here when I repot. These guys specifically, I, I know they're called San Marzanos, but I'm not sure that they're official San Marzanos. So the San Marzanos specifically originate in a region of Italy called Campania. And if you have a real, true San Marzano tomato, it's like a protected designation of origin. It's kind of similar to in France, you'd have terroirs for wine, like the, they'd have an appellation culturelle. So it's like a designation based on the native soil that it grows in and the region that it's actually harvested and produced in. So I guess kind of like the wine of tomato plants. Uh, I think there's other parts of the world and other parts of Italy specifically that have tomatoes that kind of fall into that category too. But as far as I know, they can be pretty picky about what's qualifying as a San Marzano. Now this one is labeled San Marzano. So I'm assuming that's what it is, but you know what? If we're gonna be nitpicking about it, these are probably just of the same breed, but definitely not grown there. So the San Marzano specifically was introduced commercially in 1926. And fun fact, the San Marzanos along with, I think they're called Pomodorino Vesuvio, which is like tomatoes from the surroundings of Mount Vesuvius in Southwest Italy. <laughs> Those are the only ones you can make a true Neapolitan pizza with. So like a pizza di Napoli, you need to have one of these guys or one of those guys to have the correct tomatoes to make that type of pizza. So fun fact. Now, unfortunately last year, I didn't actually grow a Roma or paste tomato variety. So I have grown them before, but last year I got nothing to show you to compare against. You can go check out any kind of Roma tomato. Amish paste is very popular in this category as well, but that's all I've got. But I would suggest like if you're into making sauces, if you're into canning, those are a good pick. So while I have you here, and I hope you're enjoying the content so far, please do drop a subscription below. It really does help the channel grow. I would love to be able to build up a good community of folks who are interested in both indoor and outdoor gardening. And that's kind of how I see this channel evolving is just like a nice balance between indoor and outdoor growing. And depending on the time of year, you might get a little more of one type of content, a little more of the other type of content. I'm not gonna go fully one direction or fully the other, at least not so far. We'll see how things pan out, but again, love to have you aboard. So please subscribe below and dropping a like doesn't hurt either. All right, now I got an interesting one for you. This is Legend. Now this is a hybrid. This is a determinate slicing tomato and it's good for, you know, sandwiches, that sort of thing. Kind of your typical standard round tomato that you would buy that's not too huge, not too small. You can use it for a burger, you can use it for a sandwich. At 68 days, this is one of the earliest slicing tomatoes that you can find. So if you're into slicing tomatoes and you're looking at one that you can catch mid-season with some ripe fruit, here you go, give this one a try. This guy originates from Oregon State University and they have a specific program for tomatoes that should be doing better in more moderate and cooler climates. Their program, I think it was Dr. Jim Baggett who is the, the founder of that program and he's created a number of different tomatoes including the Legend, the Celets, and I believe there's one called the Oregon Spring. They're all different varieties. This one is determinate. Interesting one for me is that this is aimed towards cooler climates. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this one does in my Vancouver climate because we are definitely not as hot as other parts of the world that grow a lot of tomatoes. We're not as far south. Our weather is not too far off Oregon. It might be a little less cool in the summer, but we'll see. These guys have a very sweet flavor, good balance of acid to sugars. And as far as I understand, very good yield as well. I've heard some kind of mixed reviews on the flavor of the tomatoes from this program. Specifically, I think it was the Oregon Spring, which I've heard kind of anecdotally online. When you Google around for tomatoes from this program, because I was curious like what else I could get that might be of the same ilk that might do well in my climate better than some of the other varieties. At least the Oregon Spring, the flavor was kind of weak and mild. And I don't know if that's the most interesting thing on earth, but it's worth checking out. So I thought the legend would be an interesting interesting one to give it a shot. So the suggestion is even though this is determinate, we probably will still want to stake it up because the fruit is pretty large. You get four to five inch fruit, which is pretty solid. It's, you know, we're getting into like half pound territory at that point. 
One really interesting thing about this specific plant and the fruit that it produces is that it's parthenocarpic, which means that if you don't let it cross pollinate with another plant, you can end up with completely seedless or almost seedless fruit. So uh, and I don't know that all the other varieties in this grouping are also parthenocarpic, but at least this one is. So I will drop a link to the other two varieties, like the Celets and the Oregon Spring, in case you're curious about checking these out. The Legend is the one I'm gonna try this time around. We'll see how it goes. And at the end of the season, I'll let you guys know how this one fared for me. Since these ones are a hybrid, they're meant to be pretty large and again, thick skinned. As far as I understand it, they're also resistant to late blight fungus. So late blight fungus ends up with like kind of wet spots on your leaves and then eventually on the stem. Now we're back into yet another slicing tomato. So I have two of those this year, but I bought this one specifically. This is the Black Prince. So this also falls into the category of the black tomatoes, like I mentioned earlier with the uh, black cherry and eventually with the black crim, which I'll tell you about in a bit. I bought this one because there were only two left at the nursery that I was at. So I saw this the first time around when I was doing my plant shopping and I thought to myself, you know, I don't know if I need two slicing tomatoes at the end of the day i'm a big fan of the black tomatoes having tried the black crim you can't i can't go back out you give that a try this guy however it's a bit smaller the black crim is more of a beefsteak this guy is kind of more of in that middle ground of slicer and not quite as big as the beefsteaks and not quite as small as the cherry tomatoes but i've heard that the flavor on these guys is supposed to be delicious so i'm really looking forward to this so the fruit on these guys is kind of in that two and a half to three inch range so like i said it's kind of an intermediate tomato not very big kind of like that slightly bigger than a grape tomato in length but all the way around now these guys have a really rich taste rich flavor but they're also super dark i think they're ripe as far as i understand once the skin of the tomato on the top has turned dark and there's a few traces of green up there that's when you want to harvest these guys and eventually they kind of turn this like this deep garnet color which is pretty cool this is a 70 day indeterminate so i'm going to want to stake it this dude was already creeping out of the pot so I uh, ended up putting a stake on him early just to make sure he kind of straightened out. There were two left. One was literally growing horizontally already. And I'm like, this is going to be kind of a pain in the butt to try and stake up. And this guy specifically was starting to curve off of the side of his pot. So I you know, figured straighten him out. And then when I transplant him, I'll drop him down quite a bit lower. So he'll be straight when he starts growing inside of my big container. So the black prince here is native to Irkutsk in Russia. It's related to the black crim, same parentage, I would guess at some point down the line, they all kind of came from the same place in Crimea. This is actually meant to be a true northern variety. So it does well again in northern climates. So you see like a bit of a trend in the plants that I picked up this year is that at least three or four of them are going to do well in cooler climates. So I'm really hoping that like at the end of the season, when the weather starts getting colder here in Vancouver, we end up with still having three or four plants that are doing okay and not just completely wilting and dying the minute that they reach any kind of cooler temperature, particularly in the evenings. So that happens around here is that, you know, we'll get reasonably hot summer, but by the time September rolls around, it's kind of 50-50 where they're going to have really cool evenings or not. At that point, I'm hoping that at least half of the tomatoes that I have will kind of survive and still do okay. One other thing of note with the Black Prince is that even though it is a northern variety, it apparently also does well in warmer climates. So it's kind of like an all-rounder. I'm looking forward to this one. And like I mentioned, I have this one on the Black Cherry. So that's two different black tomatoes this time around. Last year, I only had the Black Crown so I'm really looking forward to it the flavor is like really really smoky and rich it's really nice to have a tomato that's kind of different than all the others like that so that's the black prince and if you can find these guys more power to you another slicing tomato from last year so this is the supersonic this is an indeterminate f1 hybrid they're mature on the later end of things so kind of 75 to 79 days this is a hybrid from the 60s these guys get pretty chonky like this good sized tomato you get out of it it's still considered a slicer they kind of get in that 7 to 12 ounce territory for folks who are into the metric system like myself and that 225 to 350 gram range as well so that's that's a good meaty sized tomato the supersonic as i mentioned that program dates back to the 60s it's created by harris seeds in rochester new york these guys are pretty big i did grow a number of these last year I had them caged up. The plant got pretty tall. I think it was over six feet by the end of the day. Not quite as big as my cherry tomatoes, but definitely hitting the top of my cages. The actual fruit that came out of it, very hearty, very tough fruit. I would say that the flavor is kind of middle of the pack and it's an F1 hybrid. Again, they're kind of hit or miss on the flavor front. So this guy has like the VF resistance. So like Fusarium wilt and Verticillium wilt. It's, you know, disease resistant, crack resistant, that sort of thing. 
I think you trade off a bit on the flavor. Also, I find that the yield on these guys, as much as they tend to broadcast that the F1 hybrids have really good yields, I didn't get a great yield off of this personally, but you know, maybe that's just me and the way I was growing it. But I mean, I used the same setup as all of my other tomatoes and it got fed well, et cetera. At the end of the day, I think it got outproduced by a number of my other plants. So it's got the crack resistance. It's got the resistance to disease. It's got a lot of good stuff going on for it. I think you have some trade-offs with these hybrids. So I'm personally not sure I would grow this one again. It was just a little bit on the boring side for me. Last year, I also had two slicers. Now this was also an accidental pickup. In this case, I thought I had killed it. So this is the Pink Girl. The Pink Girl is a pretty well-known hybrid. It's in the same territory as the Supersonic in terms of size. It's got more of a pinky texture to the outside of the tomato. These guys are in the same, again, range of about 75, 76 days to maturity. Size-wise in that eight ounce, nine ounce range again. So like, you know, good hardy sized tomato. Now this one specifically, I didn't have a uh, great experience with and it was mostly my own fault as they were transplants, kind of like my transplant sizes here. I had these guys sitting out. I had some workers come and do some work on my electrical panel last summer and my pink girl got snapped in half. So what happened was my eight-year-old daughter, seven at the time, found this plant and it was snapped in half and she was really sad about it. And I told her, you know what, we can probably still salvage this plant. So what we did was we took the broken top half of the plant, ditched the bottom of it and rerooted it. And as expected, it rerooted very well, but it was a good almost a month behind all the other plants. So by the end of the day, I only got a couple of fruit off this plant. So I can't really tell you, based off of what I got, whether it's worth buying or not. However, based off of what I've read online, I would probably give this one another chance at another point in the future and give it another try just because I didn't really give it a fair shot in the first place. Interesting fact about this specific pink girl tomato is that this guy is resistant to everything. It's got like every resistance known under the side. I think it's like V-F-A-S-T. I don't even know what half of those are. There's a couple of different types of wilt there. Uh, there's the tobacco mosaic virus, I think. And then there's a couple of ones that I've never even heard of. Some of these things I've never run into and I don't think I ever will, but at least this way you know. So if you're looking for something that's disease resistant and crack resistant, this is up there in terms of like being resistant to everything. Again, as you would expect with a hybrid that has tons of resistance, the drawback on these guys is that the flavor, according to what I've read online, like I said, I didn't have many of these to try out. The flavor is pretty mild juicy good sized fruit but you know it's kind of your everyday tomato slicer nothing too special these guys are a vigorous heavy grower heavy producers they have good yield all season long so they can get tall bushy you're going to want to stake and cage these things as much as you can they can get pretty big if you're looking for something that's going to hold up to a lot of potential diseases and have you know crack resistance so pretty hardy plant in general and you're willing to trade off on the taste a little bit then yeah good pick uh, i'd probably give it another try just to see for myself what it's like because it didn't have the greatest experience with it the first time of no fault of its own and again this is that whole like heirloom versus hybrid debate that rages on until the ends of the earth if you really want flavor you go one way but you're gonna like trade off on productivity and on resistances so you know up to you if you want to go that road but i'd like to have a balance of everything and that way no matter what happens i've got something to eat and on the upside if i get some of these really nice ones i can kind of intersperse them with the common stuff two hours later we are up to the final final handful here i think i've got another three more tomatoes left and then we have our special guest at the end this is the beef steaks the big juicy heavy suckers that you're going to get in sucker there's a tomato pot in there somewhere beef steak tomatoes if you've never grown them before they're big i would like to introduce you to this guy here this is the mortgage lifter. We're talking like at least a pound, probably in the neighborhood of six to eight inches in girth. These are great for burgers, really good for burgers. Throw this on the barbecue on some burgers, this could be pretty cool. I mean, you can chop them up and just kind of eat them as is. You can just put salt on it and just eat it like a steak. The mortgage lifter you can get up to four pounds. Four pounds, that's massive. I don't think I've ever had a four pound tomato. I think I've had some slightly over one pound tomatoes in the past, but that's about it. So this is gonna be an experiment. I specifically got this guy because I've heard of the mortgage lifter. It's kind of, uh, you know, in the folklore of tomatoes, this one has an interesting reputation. This is an indeterminate tomato, if you can believe it. It's in the 85 day range, which is, you know, to maturity, that's a pretty long, long wait. You're pretty much end of season at that point. They are climbers. They're not gonna grow as tall as your, you know, supersonics, for instance. You're still talking three, four feet tall and putting on some massive fruit at the end of the day. With the kind of weight you're talking about on here, you're probably gonna want not only a steak, but a cage as well to hold this guy up. And I'm not talking like your little tiny three, 
foot tomato cages. I'm talking about something that's going to be able to hold up multiple two or three pound fruits. So we'll see how this guy does with my cages. I hope that I have the right form factor for this. I might have to use a bit of a shorter cage and a bit stouter. We'll give it a try and I will report back. Like I said, they can get up to four pounds, but the average is still in that one to two pound range, which is pretty big. I mean, two pounds is like pushing a kilogram. So the cool story behind the mortgage lifter is the original progenitor of this specific heirloom variety is a guy named M.C. Biles of Logan, West Virginia. So apparently back in the 1930s, 40s era, and I'm not really sure exactly when, this guy was selling these plants for a dollar each, and he managed to pay off his $6,000 mortgage simply by selling these plants, which is epic. I mean, imagine that in today's dollars. This guy has superior cracking resistance, which is pretty uncommon in an heirloom and definitely uncommon in a uh, fruit of this size, which is pretty cool. At the same time, has a superb flavor, delicious taste. I mean, it sounds great. This being a classic heirloom beef steak, as far as I can tell, there's really kind of no downside to this guy besides the sheer size of the fruit that you're getting out of it. So hopefully, hopefully I can actually pull off some of those one to two pound fruits. I'm really looking forward to trying this guy out and just kind of see what kind of results I get with it. And I will definitely report back at the end of season what these guys are like, but I'm going to get this one into the ground pretty fast here. I only have the one beef steak for this year because I don't think I can handle more than that. Plus, some of the bigger slicers can get into beef steak territory size-wise. Last year, I grew two, one of which was more of an heirloom unique beef steak. And we'll get to that in a second. But the first one that I grew was this guy here, the Big Beef. This is a 73-day indeterminate. I had pretty good results with this one. I had not a huge amount of production. I think it's rated for pretty high production from what I can see. It's an extra large fruit. It's really meaty, kind of uniform shape. This is kind of your standard beef steak that you'll find at the grocery store. It's an indeterminate hybrid, so you're going to get pretty good size growth out of this guy. Now, at the end of the day, I'm not sure if you're going to get the same kind of flavor you get from an heirloom beef steak, but... I would still suggest that if you're looking for something that's going to grow pretty well for you with good resistance to disease, good cracking resistance, that sort of thing, and still be pretty big, like these go up to about 12 ounces, so like that 340 gram territory. That's a solid size, not as huge as the mortgage lifter that I was showing you a second ago. But this is still going to get big enough for you, and this will kind of suit your needs if you're looking for that really big tomato, but it's going to grow pretty comfortably and, you know, be relatively safe to grow. The big beef is very, very disease resistant. If you live in a climate where you're kind of prone to disease, if you're going to grow a beef steak, this is the one you want to grow. I will list the amount of diseases this thing has covered and resistances that it has. I think it's something like VFFNTA, and I cannot remember for the life of me everything that includes, but I think there's about six different resistances listed there, but the coverage is pretty good. From my experience last year, the yield, I can't really speak to it. It grew to, I want to say, somewhere around five feet for me. As far as I remember, I don't think I had the greatest output from it. And I think that comes down to watering for me personally. I think that I had some fluctuations in my watering quantities and we took a vacation a couple of long weekends here and there where things just started to dry out a little bit. That's never good when you're growing some of these big beef steaks. Like they like to have consistent water. So the big beef has a good balance of sweetness and acid. So if you're looking for something that's gonna grow really well in a situation where you might have a lot of disease and that you want something that's gonna stand up to kind of a harsher climate, that sort of thing. And you're willing to trade off a little bit on the flavor. I think this one's probably a little on the sweeter side then I would go with this. Personally, I could kind of take it or leave it on this guy. You get into that generic hybrid territory of like, these are really kind of safe plays and I'm leaning towards more heirloom these days. So my final 2022 tomato last year was this guy. And this is the Black Crim. So these guys originate on the Isle of Crim, which I believe is on the northern coast of the Black Sea, just off of Crimea. I've had a hard time looking this up on a map. I'm not sure if maybe it's just an old term for an area that exists currently under some other name. Maybe it's just called something else these days. I'm not really sure, but looking it up, it just points me to Crimea every time I look it up. These guys, again, this is in the same category as the Black Cherry that I showed you earlier and the Black Prince. However, this is the beef steak. These are all different tomatoes, but this is a beef steak black tomato. So if you're looking for something that has like that beef steak size, but has the smoky rich flavor of the black tomatoes, then this is the one you want to grow. I've grown in the past the Cherokee purple, which is you know, a completely different stock, 
but a similar type of heirloom where you're like, this is just a really unique type of tomato to grow. This guy falls into that same category. I love this tomato. I didn't get that many off the plant and that is one of those issues with heirlooms that you're gonna run into is like the productivity is just not gonna be there compared to the hybrids. But wow, did it taste great. And they were really cool looking. You're gonna get some kind of funky looking tomatoes here and there, but the ones that you do get, and you, you may get a smaller crop than you would get from a hybrid, but the ones you get are delicious and they are so cool to look at. They look great. Very, very unique looking tomatoes. They're really like that kind of black and burgundy combination, which is really neat. It's good to show off. You got people over here. For me, like people walking past my driveway, checking out the tomatoes that I've got growing out there. A, the risk of tomato theft is high with these cool tomatoes. And second, people always ask questions. So if you're into chatting about gardening to anybody who's walking by who's interested, these are a great conversation starter and the, the flavor is out of this world. So these guys get from about eight to 12 ounce. So these are pretty hefty as well, but they're on the, the smaller side for a beef steak. They're 80 day indeterminate. So this is kind of late season as well. They're still gonna get pretty big. I think mine grew definitely over five feet from what I remember last year. The reason also that I'm not entirely sure how big these can get personally is that I bought this really late season. So I actually found this well after I had already planted out all of my other tomatoes. And I found this just sitting there at the end of season clear out. And I was like, I gotta try this one. I'm not even sure what it's about. And I did some research afterwards to find out more about it. I wish I had had it from the beginning of the season. So that's why I went with two black tomatoes this year, even though they're not beef steaks. I'm still really curious to see like how much productivity I can get out of them if I let them run the course of the entire season. So the black crim specifically was the first black tomato ever introduced to the North American market from my research. I think it came in around 1990 and it was a Swedish fellow by the name of Lars Olaf Rosenstrom from Broma, Sweden. So I hope I got that right. If he's still out there, I hello, <laughs> your tomatoes are awesome. But this does originate in Ukraine and, you know, worked its way through Southern Russia. This one specifically may not have the Northern traits that the Black Prince seems to have, but I definitely was able to grow this just fine where I live here. And I would highly recommend this one. Again, you're gonna get some non-uniformly shaped fruit. It's gonna be a little bit funky looking here and there, but at the end of the day, the rich kind of salty, smoky flavor that you get, it's worth any inconsistencies in the look of the tomato. So I would 100% grow this again, 10 out of 10 recommend. All right, we are at the final plant and this is not a tomato, but like I mentioned, it's tomato adjacent. So what do I have for you here today? I have a tomatillo. This guy is the Rio Grande Verde tomatillo. Oh. I have never grown a tomatillo before, so I am experimenting with this guy. These are determinate plants, so they're a bush that will grow to kind of in the three foot tall range if you let them go. These are in the 85 to 90 day range, so they're definitely later in the season. You can plant these guys near your tomatoes. They produce kind of like this apple-y looking fruit, but they have a firmer texture to the fruit and they're much more cold hardy. Some interesting facts about tomatillos, if you're not familiar, they grow with a husk on the outside of the fruit. So the fruit ends up with this kind of little shield around it. You're gonna to wanna to harvest the fruit when it's still green, but it's starting to yellow or lighten up a little bit on the blossom end. If you wanna get them when they're a little bit on the sweeter side is when you wait till the husk is starting to crack and the fruit is turning yellow. They grow to kind of the three to four ounce range. They are high in fiber, high in vitamin C, vitamin K, and they have antioxidant properties. They also have beta carotene. So if you're looking for something that's gonna improve your eye health or at least can it contribute to it positively it's probably worth giving these guys a try they really look like they're kind of like halfway between a tomato plant and a pepper they're still in the solanaceous family so nightshades that sort of thing they are not tomatoes but they have tomato like properties definitely like growth habit looks tomato-y but if we actually look at the plant itself and like the way it's branching it looks more like a pepper so pretty cool the tomatillo originates in Mexico. These are really used heavily in like salsa verde. They're good raw, you can eat them raw. There's no problems with that. I've heard some rumor out there that they can hurt you if you eat them when they're raw. But you know what, I'm pretty sure that's an urban legend. Either way, you can cook them, you can eat them raw. You can also use them in salads or as a garnish with meat dishes. So they're pretty versatile. So another interesting fact about the tomatillo is that you need to have at least two plants because they are self incompatible. So basically the same plant cannot self pollinate. And I have this guy, but I actually have two more of them as well. With three plants, I should be in pretty good shape to pollinate, but you're gonna wanna buy at least two of them. Then that way you should have some cross pollination between the two plants to be able to produce fruit. 
These guys are pretty high yielding. So even though they're a medium sized plant, kind of in that three foot range, I think it's suggested that you stake them. This is actually a pretty good use for those crappy tomato cages that you might have seen. The ones that you buy from the grocery store or whatever, and they're about three foot high and made of wire. You know, it's got two, three rings and a couple of big stems to hold it in. They're cheap. They're not the most useful for tomatoes. For tomatillos, they're actually not a bad idea. And they're the right kind of height and they'll give you the right support. So if you're looking for something to use your old beat up tomato cages on, that's not a bad use for them. So I'm really looking forward to trying out the tomatillo here. This definitely reminds me more of a pepper than of a tomato, but when you put them beside a tomato plant, they're almost like halfway in between in the way they're designed, I guess. I've had salsa verde, but I've never actually eaten a tomatillo raw or even cooked before, and I've definitely never grown one before. So I'm looking forward to trying these guys out, and I really hope that having three plants is enough to get me going in terms of pollination. Considering I already have flowers going on here, things are looking like they're in pretty good shape. So there we have it, my haul of tomatoes for the year and one non-tomato. I hope that you really enjoyed the content. If you have any video suggestions or questions about the tomatoes I've shown, please do drop that comment below. I read all the comments and I try and respond to all of them too. If you did enjoy this, it would be awesome if you'd subscribe. I would love to build a community here of folks who have similar interests to mine. Indoor, outdoor growing is something that I'm really passionate about. And I find that a lot of the channels out there just pick one or the other and don't really have much crossover between both of those two areas. Maybe I'm de-niching myself, but I'm gonna give it a shot. So please do drop a like below if you're interested, and I will be back very soon with another video. I am planning to do a video similar to this one for my pepper plants and potentially for my eggplants and things like that, since I do have a number of other plants that I'm growing, not just tomatoes. If there's interest in that sort of thing, please drop a note down in the comments below and I am happy to make another video to talk about my experiences growing peppers from last year and what I've got lined up for this year because I have a whole pile of interesting peppers and I'm not going to go quite as spicy as I did last year. So thanks again for being here. Really happy to have you here and happy to share my experience growing these guys out. I will post updates on these tomatoes as they grow throughout the season and do a recap of my findings and determinations and takeaways at the end of the season. And I will let you know what I would think in terms of growing them again or not growing them again. So that is all for today. I'm Nick from Propist. I hope you have a great day and a wonderful start to your growing season.